Jesus sends his people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. On the Tijuana side of the U.S.-Mexico border today, mayhem. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. The Trump administration is threatening to separate more parents and kids at the border, screaming and crying. They are traumatized. We're taking people out of the country. You wouldn't believe how bad these people are. These are people. These are animals. to keep on being freedom fighters. We're going to keep on holding rallies. We're going to keep on protesting. We are going to scream as loud as we can for as long as we can. I want to say this loud. I want to hear it. I want to hear it clear. Refugees are welcome here. question was, well, what crime did they commit? At which point she called over the police and they were arrested. Because, of course, the kids committed no crime at all. It's a stretch to say that their parents committed a crime. We know that that's not true. No. Of course, we don't take kids away for any United States from Mr. Miller. No. If they did that... Even if they did. But they weren't even charged. They, they were, they, their parents were charged. And therefore, that was their rationale for taking them away. But as we know, the real reason was to punish them to as a disincentive. And the whole idea of charging these people anyway is part of the zero tolerance policy. They weren't charged before. They were, they were released. You know, catch and release, catch and release. That's a, that's a ridiculous policy, but it's a lot more humane than what we're doing. Tornillo was like, I want to see if there's any action going on there, and I'll be there for the national action on the, on the 30th. came down from Brooklyn, I guess because I was tired of sitting and watching the TV and yell at it, and yelling at it, and thought I could come down here and, uh, and yell at some of the people that are actually involved in, in doing, what, uh, doing what it is that's gotten me so fired up. This is the, uh, the border between Mexico and, uh, and uh, the United States. It's a, it's a border uh, made by a, a not very wide, dirty river. And coming to the edge of that 
river and asking for refuge are people who are desperate enough to, to leave their homes and, uh, and, 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 and come here and ask for help. And instead of uh, opening our arms and offering them help, what we've done is uh, we started putting them in jail and we started separating families and we started doing things like that. And it just seemed so horrendous that I, I figured I had to come down to the, to the front lines here of the struggle against that. Um, I've been down here for over a week. I've, uh, I've been at detention centers demonstrating. I managed to get myself arrested once. Uh, I'm hoping that this draws attention to it. It seems to have gotten some reaction from the, from the federal government. At least they think that it looks bad for them. And they're trying to make it look better. Uh, but that won't be enough because detention is detention. They're putting people in jail basically for being poor and desperate. And that's got to stop. see on this bridge is people facing each other that look exactly the same, that are exactly the same, and, uh, and shouldn't have to face off against each other ever. Here we are, in the middle of a bridge, in the middle of a border that really doesn't have to exist. I came down from Brooklyn in order to open my arms and say, immigrants are welcome. When people come to the border as refugees, they come because they have to leave their homes. Leaving their homes is a painful, painful thing to do. Nobody does it easily. Something drives them out. And when people come asking for help, what we should give them is help, and not put them in jail, not put them in detention, not take their children. So the border here is the front line of the struggle. a few hours today at uh, probably one of the loneliest spots on earth in a small border crossing in Texas near El Paso where I'm sure uh, authorities decided that nobody would ever discover the fact that there were hundreds of children behind fences, behind berms, hidden from sight. I stood with my sign indicating to people passing that this was the place where the children held, calling for their freedom. I got some encouragement. I was talking to somebody down here, and they were so, they, they thanked me. I was thanked, I, you know, they were so grateful. We've been doing this by ourselves so long, it's so great to have somebody come down. It's so great. And it, that's a very warm moment, and I feel, I, I feel, I feel good. And 
I turn and I thank, I thank that person and I say, thank you for keeping the struggle going without me because I have to go home and it hurts to go home. I, I'm going to feel guilty as I fly out of here. Even though I don't know if I'm doing any good, I'm going to feel guilty as I leave because uh, it's only a couple of weeks. There's, a, there's a, a whole lifetime of struggle going on down here. This is the struggle. And it's not going to be over in a day. It's not going to be over in a week. It's not going to be over in a few years. It's going to be a really long time. I don't know if I'm assuaging my guilt so much as, uh, as I can't sit still. I don't know how to sit still. I don't know how to not do something. I'm going to have to learn again when I go back. <laughs> if I don't learn, I guess I'll end up back here. I've been living on the, the uh, vigil diet here, and it's, uh, it's been very healthy so far. The only problem is the dust. It'll, it'll get you coughing after a while. I'm going um, I'm to, I'll go to the spot where I usually stand, so you can uh, see my post. This woman over here has walked over from Mexico. She's waiting for somebody to pick her up and give her a ride to the civilization, which, as you can see, if you look that way, is not so close to here. This is the middle of a desert. Not too long, they'll be playing soccer over there. You'll be able to get pictures of them over there. What I've been observing the last few weeks here is the incredible growth of this place. You're gonna see uh, equipment going in, you're gonna see tents going in, you're gonna see raw lumber going in. Um, that's kind of what tipped me off <laughs> right away about, about the discrepancy between what they're saying, closing it down, and what's really, uh, what's really happening. Uh, they've been ramping it up, big time. As far as kids moving in and out, it takes a lot of vigilance to catch them. Um, they, they used to move them in big buses. Um, the big buses were a little too obvious, I think, and they've taken to taking them in, uh, in smaller vans, several smaller vans when they take them to court or when they take them in. Um, but about, I guess, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, there was a whole bunch of kids brought in from the airport. And I was able to see, um, you know, see evidence of the, of the buses coming in. That was the night they brought in a, 150 girls, which is, um, for the most part, all the local people are very, very opposed to this camp. Um, some people are torn, however, because they pay amazing amounts of money in there. They pay twice, three times as much as they could get anywhere else. Um, and that, unfortunately, uh, overcomes issues of conscience for a lot of people. Uh, once they're in there, they tell themselves that they're doing something good. And I think they actually uh, manage to uh, convince themselves that they're uh, doing a good job feeding and, and taking care of these kids. But uh, there's no denying and in any discussion, you do get to the point where people generally admit that being in a place where you can't leave and you can't be with your family and you can't touch anybody else, and you can't talk to the people you want to talk to or hang out with the people you want to hang out with, it makes it a prison. And uh, a prison is not a good place, even with ice cream. From my outpost outside the gates of the Tornillo prison complex, just a few hundred yards from the bridge across the river whose fate it has been to divide a community. I am on the front line of a battle, not between nations. Is it too dramatic to call this a war between darkness and, in Lincoln's locution, our better angels? 
I think there are more of us than there are of them, but they are sending troops to the border. We have to have troops here too, troops of better angels at the border. Join me at Tornio. This is really pretty good. I'm gonna have to buy a few. This is just what I need in the evening here, you know. Certain things that happen in the world that are affected by people looking at them. It's kind of, it's kind of a quantum notion, right? If we observe this, it changes the, the quality of it. People inside who are working here know now that they're observed. I'm taking a little walk to see if at this hour of the morning we can just uh, kind of, in a subtle way, get around the uh, camp on the, on the side that backs right up against the border, and the border fence. Tornillo Prison is a, a strange place that depends on uh, various pipelines to keep it going. It's very fragile. So this is the... Uh, this is the water that supplies all of the wash water in the entire camp. Without this water, I don't know how this camp would operate. Oh, yeah. Can you ask your guys to leave us alone? Well, they want to see the water procedure, and they're not my guys. I, I, huh? I don't care if they're interested. I know everybody's interested. There have been senators, congressmen, reporters, lawyers, attorneys, judges. Everyone's been in there. Yeah. If you want to know what's going on in there and get a tour, contact them. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a funny idea they had, putting it out here. I mean, we know why they put it out here. It's because it's, it's so hidden. Those are the original tents that uh, gained so much notoriety at the beginning of this camp, right there. But I tell you, with all these big tents that have gone up, I'm sure at least one or two of them is a boy's tent. This is their effort at keeping people from seeing plastic stuff they put up. But it's also so fragile because it, it doesn't have its own water, it doesn't have its own electricity, it doesn't have its own, it, it has, it, we're no, nowhere near a food supply. You know, everything has to be trucked in. How you doing? Are you waiting to deliver something inside there? Yes. Yeah, what do you got in the love? What, what's in there? Uh, can, uh... Four generators. Uh, four generators, uh-huh. $540,000, huh? Pretty expensive stuff, huh? Everything that's in there has to be trucked in. It has to be trucked in through very few constricted arteries. This is all to supply thousands of people inside. When we, if we walk over that way and the people inside see us, they're going to contact the farmers and uh, order us to get off. Oh, they're gonna call the sheriff. Um, and you sure get the feeling that they're carrying guns. This is Texas. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. What's a complaint right now that uh, we almost got uh, in front of one of the vans or something like that? Oh no. Just, uh, just no, that, that didn't that didn't happen. And uh, but but there are, you know there are a couple of sheriff's uh, trucks here, and uh, like I say, they're talking pretty roughly at the moment. And everything was going. Hey. Okay. 
they they're just making up these reports. Uh, I, I you know they don't. I know they don't like having us around, and I, I don't blame them. We're opposed to what they're doing, but they're making up stories. We're very polite people. Very. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't do that though. Just they made. They're really making it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because they wanted to us to remove it from the property. We told them, you know what? This is public area. Oh. Is, so they're looking for an excuse, huh? Yeah, they're looking for an excuse. Okay. Yeah, yeah, 13 to 17. Yeah. The boys and girls. And they've been keeping them there for a really long time. Uh, they, they're having a hard time placing them because ice is getting in the way. Because they scare their families so badly, you know? And that's why we're here. We're here because we don't think this is a, a fair situation. Okay. You know? Well, being a witness is, is committing the subversive act of seeing. Right, so as a witness, I encourage reflection. They see me seeing them, and then they see themselves. Well, okay. I'm just you telling. You gotta understand. They're, they're making a living. Man. Oh, they I got do. families. They got. I, they got to I said that to the. Them. That's what I said to them. <clears throat> no, I said I understand. They're paying you three times what you'd make anywhere else. I understand, but you might want to think about this because this is going to go down in history as something very, very shameful. And it's my hope that witnessing brings about that, that act of reflection that leads to the question that I really want people who work here and who support this financially and, uh, and, and the, the government that makes this possible. It's for the idea that people can look at themselves and say, I might not be doing something right. I might be doing something really wrong. to come over here and tell you to give him a call. So. Okay. Well, I'll do that. Frank, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to take a picture of the sign so he can see what, you know, what's You can see what the story is. Okay. Yeah, and I just send it to him and he'll take it from there, I guess. Okay. It was a big rally here, of what, about a month ago. Oh, yeah. And a whole bunch of uh, religious leaders came right. and they put up these signs, right? Let our children go. It's from the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. You know? And uh, they came here and they put up these signs. It's been here for weeks. It's just they got excited because they don't, they don't want anybody seeing what, what's going on. They don't want anybody talking right. about what's going on. They're just trying to get rid of us. So, yeah, we're trying to get the information out, you know, right. alert. Alert everybody in the country, but also alert El Paso, right? They're going outside right now. I can see them over there in the middle, all the people. Yeah. It's, they play soccer over there. Oh, they do? Yeah. That's pretty much their main activity there. They play soccer. I'm going to send my uh, boss a message. A message. Now, here's, here's a bus full of people going into family detention. Is that bus? Yeah. That's a family detention. Then what do you do after that? Do you take them out again? Or? After they come here, they go back to El Paso. See? It's full of people, right? They always look like kids to me, but they say it's family detention. But after they come here, they get processed, you know, some of them get ankle bracelets and stuff like that. And then they go to Annunciation House in El Paso, right? And they, they take them in there, they process them. So they take down their information, they put the ankle bracelets on them, and they take them to Annunciation House, where finally, for the first time in, you know, in days, they get a nice meal, they get a nice bed. They're, they're nice people, the Annunciation House people. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they really are. And then they go off to, uh, so they sponsor families, right? To wait to find out if they get granted asylum. Because all of these people are applying for asylum. You know, they're, right. they're running from those desperate situations in Central America. So they'll come out, those people are gonna come out a few hours later. They don't know that this is like the end of an ordeal. Right. And then they're gonna go to a nice place next. So that's, that's, the, that's the good news. They're gonna go someplace nice next, but they don't know yet. Hello? Hey, Bernie, what's going on? I was here with Mr. Uh, Rubin. Yeah, you know, um, that, that's all I can say. You know, I'm just saying, uh, I, I don't think, I don't think you wanna get, you're going to want to see that on the Internet, the county people taking it down, and these guys are nice guys. And I, I don't want to see them looking like bad guys. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you know, even if you take them down, somebody's going to come here and put them up again. You know, until this, until this children's prison goes away, 
this is just going to it's just going to go back and forth. So I thought maybe I could save you the trouble and you could just, you know, forget about them for now. Eventually they'll go down. Eventually this will all go back and the way it was when, you know, after this place closes. Is, is that all right? Is that, does that sound okay to you? It's a shame, huh? There's a, uh, a county ordinance that says no advertising on the on county fences. Yeah, that's uh, that's how it was explained to me. I tried to convince the county that it's it's gonna be worse for them to take it down. It's not gonna look very good. By the way, I just got a communication that there are more than three thousand kids in there. They're adding them every day. Makes me really sad about the ones in Spanish because the kids can read it when they're going in, you know? You know? And they're not going to get to see that now. Might give them hope, you know? You see this one here? This one was made by... Uh, and there were kids in a family that spent the night over here. And they saw all the other kids in there. And some people ran into them at a, at a shelter. And they said to the kids, like, what, what do you want us to tell... What kind of message do you want to give to the kids inside? So you can read it, right? Right? Esfuerzate y se valiente. No temas ni desmayes porque Dios siempre está contigo. It was supposed to be, uh, you know, it's from the book of Joshua, right? It's, uh, you know, it reminds them that somebody's on their side, right? right. God is on their side, right? Exactly. Right? This one is really delicate, so maybe you could be careful when they're taking it down. You go to, you know what, I want to leave those two here. Is that okay? You want to leave them? Yeah, okay. Yeah? Yeah. That's that. I'll take care of them. Right. Okay. We'll be. Those that follow here know that the prison camp, the sheriff, the county all made my day a lot harder than anyone would have liked. But I am still at my post and though the banners were taken down, they are in the back of my car because the county employees could not bring themselves to take them away as they had been instructed. Since they were disobeying instructions, this was a small act of courage. And that's what we need, many small acts of courage. You know, it, it's a, the reason to care about kids like this is, is, is this. It's not the reason to care. The reason I care about these kids is because I can see their faces in my mind. We're going around to see if we can get some, uh, you, so you can get some footage of, uh, of kids uh, not from such a great distance. The more we explore this, the, uh, the better for me because the whole Christmas and Tornillo action seems to involve ideas of getting close enough to those children to, uh, to sing, wave, and communicate with them that uh, there are people on the outside that care about them. Um, it's been a long, it, it took a long time before I could actually see their faces. I don't know, maybe I got a little bolder and I was able to circle around passing by the the border fence, along the border fence, until we got to an area where there were kids playing soccer. Yeah. Right there, balls flying all over the place. And instead of seeing these kids from a distance, I saw them up close. I saw, I saw some joy in their faces as they played. I saw some uncertainty. I think that it's a very human quality. I think humans, when they look at the face of a child, feel sympathy. 
Now, when, um, when people think of immigrants, they don't necessarily think of children. They may think of, oh, whatever the right wing kind of wants them to think of. But almost everybody, when they see a child's face, thinks differently. They feel something, which is probably why it's so hard to see these kids inside here. So I care about these kids because once I look at them, once I imagine them, I know that they're my kids and they're your kids. They're everybody's kids. <laughs> you know, it's our responsibility to make sure that what's going on with them stops. How you doing? Good. Just do me a favor, don't try to talk to the people. How come? Uh, because nobody's allowed to talk to you. Why? Just not. How? I just don't understand. Why? It, explain. Why can't I talk I don't to you? I'm not to you, sir. I'm asking you something. You're asking okay. me, yes. I understand. Okay. So you can't tell me why it is you can't talk to them. What, what would happen if you talked to them? I mean, I'm not going to try because you asked me not to at the moment. I will try, but you can't explain it to me. No, it's just a rule. You can talk to them, right? Uh, can you? I mean, are you allowed to talk to them? You don't want to tell me that either. Come on, you, you must be allowed to talk to them. The wind's going to come up later, you know, if you heard. The wind's going to come up later. They say it's going to be a big wind today. Probably get pretty dusty. How did the generators handle that dust? I always wondered. Are they, are they okay with it? That's beyond my. You, you never noticed, I guess. And also, what what are these new shelters that are coming in? They keep coming past me in the plaza there. Sorry, so I can't answer any questions. You can't. Well, I'll, I'll just keep trying, and <laughs> maybe maybe you'll answer, answer one of them by accident. You know, one of the things I always wonder is why there's so much secrecy. You know, I, I think people inside here think they're doing a really good job, right? They're taking care of these kids real well. So how come there's so much secrecy about it? You can't tell me that either, huh? Are those the big guns coming my way? Those guys over there? Looks like it. Are they your supervisors? How come they're not allowed to talk to me? What happens to them if they do talk to me? They seem kind of afraid of you. Is that right? I'm kind of afraid of you too. I saw the reaction of the people, the personnel inside, who, who seemed most worried of all things about, about the kids talking to us or us talking to the kids. They, they were just instructing them not to talk. And, So guys, uh, what the other the other talks were no good? What's the matter? You can't talk to people. So what are you afraid they're gonna say to me if they talk to me, Mister, Senor? I knew that, that that was their attitude. I knew that they didn't want communication to happen. I'm not exactly sure what their thinking is on that. Um, but they, I saw them instructing kids not to speak to, to me, and, and I saw them obeying. And I, that might have been the most frightening thing of all. What makes them obey like that? What makes them go along with that? But a couple of kids didn't. ¿Cómo estás? What's up, bro? ¿De dónde viene? Salvador. ¿Cuánto tiempo aquí? Cuatro meses. Cuatro meses. Wow. Cinco meses. Tres. Oh, no. I saw all those kids playing. I saw 
kids hesitant to, uh, to communicate, but also in a way kind of eager to say something. But they're, they're under instructions not to talk to anybody out there. I think even as we got closer, they were being instructed not to talk to us. Um, but a couple of guys did. I asked, I asked the kid how he was. He indicated not so good with his hands, with gestures. Uh, I asked him how long he'd been in there. He told me four months. And then two kids right next to him, one chimed in with six months and another chimed in with three months. On our way away from there, that guy found his way over to the fence, sat down, and I was able to say to him, no están solos, which means you, you guys are not alone. His friend replied, exacto, got another thumbs up. And, uh, and I kind of wanted to cry. Well, we breathed a lot of dust. Yes. But besides that, I think we all did pretty well. I grew up in West Texas. Oh, you did? I used to walk home from school in those storms. Oh, really? <laughs> well, you probably still have some of that dust in your I lungs then. I probably do. That's last time. Well, you're going to be 18 yeah. again. You're going to be 18 Next again. I'm going like that fucking <laughs> bed in the jail is going to be hard. You know? be they, hard. they don't have room in the jail for you. <laughs> <laughs> for the f five thousand. Um, my friend Julie and I live, she lives in New Braunfels. I live in San Marcos, which is two little towns between Austin and San Antonio. Um, so we're eight hours away. And we were trying to think, how can we help this man? I don't think, I mean, I've been following this since Joshua got here. And I, I really don't think I captured the scope of it till I got here. We don't believe that most people would be okay with this if they really knew what was going on, if they focused on it for a little bit, I think it would break a lot of hearts. Just knowing the proximity of those kids is, makes it hard. Um, and I like witnessing and doing what we're doing, but I also just want to march in there and do something. But this is the something that we can do right now. People call and ask questions. I post what I see on my Facebook page, which is called Witness to Neo. I respond to questions that are asked there. I respond to comments. I try and facilitate plans to do more for better me, more people. And uh, it's a powerful witness. Even when they're not screaming and carrying on and making a big scene. He just sits out here with his sign. And he's drawing people from all over the place. Um, it was a wonderful shot in the arm for me that one person can, can do a lot. I answer questions. I explore little mysteries. Why did that car go there? What are they carrying? Why are those lights flashing? I try and arrange for what's gonna happen after I leave. I can't be here forever. A group of local protesters joined by people from across the country outside of Torneo's tent city to speak up for social justice. It's in my blood to want to fight for children that are incarcerated that are just looking for freedom and wanting to be with family. Today we're here for the primary purpose of standing with and for more than the 2,300 children who for some have been imprisoned for these last six months when these tents were erected. Right now they are separated from the embrace of their families during this holiday and they can't, yeah, they can't be with their families. It makes me feel very good to see you all here. We have to, we have to keep this vigil. We have to keep watching because I, they're not going to do it without us. They're not going to do it without us doing something. 
they're not going to do it unless they feel that we're willing to put on this struggle, put on this fight. These protesters are speaking out against the housing of migrant children in the Tordillo facility where more than 2,000 children are waiting to be released. Group members told KTSM they were hoping to raise awareness of current administration's border policies. What we're trying to do is like show that this is part of a larger and broken system that is no longer serving any of us. We're losing our humanity by being within it. The pressure that you have brought to bear has produced policy changes that have been good for these kids and other children who are depending on us, our advocacy, and our willingness to stand up and to be counted at this moment. It says along the current trajectory, and if he's able to hold strong and not accept any more children, by mid-January, Tornillo will shut down. That, that is because of you, everyone who's been out here. Now listen, let's not take his word for it. Let's not take my word for it. Let's continue to show up here. Let's continue to get behind Josh and others who've been here every single day so that we can witness with our own eyes, testify in our own words back to our fellow Americans what is happening here. On behalf of the Congressional District, the 750,000 people that I represent in El Paso, I just want to say thank you to each one of you who is helping to make this possible to let you know that we will be back here again and again until Tornillo closes down. So thank you, and thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank you for what you're doing. I try and imagine that the Christmas event will actually shut this place down. And it'll change the hearts of, uh, of people in government and or just make it too damn difficult for them to keep doing this. And it will just start to horrify too much. I'm not here because I hope that things are gonna be better. As time goes on, I think I have a kind of hope for, as a result of being here. And that is that <laughs> This place is so screwed up that I think it can be, it can be, we can, we can, we can close it. Um, if they were any smarter, <laughs> I, don't, I wouldn't think it. And I'd be here, I'd be here hopelessly. But I have to say that, you know, I've gotten to the point in life, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not young, that I can't and don't depend on hope to motivate me. I just do what I feel like I have to do. I'm compelled not to succeed, but just to try. On the road, Melissa and I took a last walk around the perimeter of Tornillo Prison for Children and saw more of what I've been seeing for days since just before Christmas, the dismantling of an atrocity. It is accelerating now, the organization that ran this place anxious to put this behind them. They say that by Sunday there'll be no children in their tents and by the end of the month no tents to remind us of this camp in the West Texas desert. This place that at its peak marched 3,000 refugee children from tent to tent in single file, each child kept from family in the name of God knows what. Head over to my spot across the street here.
it is. There's another one coming. Here it comes. I'm sure at first, first time they heard it, they, they were probably pretty afraid. But it, uh, it certainly contributes to uh, the, the sense of militarization that uh, not only obviously permeates a place like an Air Force base, but also the, the situation when they cross the border, you know, with the, uh, the armed guards holding uh, automatic weapons uh, as they made their way across. The idea that people find this place, uh, that might find this place a, a friendly place to spend time is a, it's a delusion, I think, that some of the personnel have convinced themselves of. But uh, kids, kids aren't dumb. They know when they're in prison. And uh, the thunder of those uh, jet fighters taking off every day must contribute to some of the distress they feel. It ain't warm, that's for sure. About the same time that they announced that Tornillo, the 10th prison in Texas, was going to close, they also announced that they were going to add 1,000 beds to this place. But it's got a, a few wrinkles to it. It's, it's run by a private agency the same way as it was in Tornillo. The big difference here is that it's actually for profit. It's for profit. It's a, there's a company named Caliburn that bought up comprehensive health services and actually has issued an IPO. They're selling shares. So uh, for those of you who can stand, whose consciousness can stand it, you can invest in prisons for children uh, and perhaps make money on it. Um, thousand bucks a night per kid, and they can slow walk every kid just like they did in Tornillo. They have kids in here for months and months and months. Every day that goes by, ka -ching, another thousand bucks per, per day per kid. It's an overflow facility that has the added advantage of being on federal land and not beholden to state regulations that protect children or anything like that. Not beholden to the rules that say you can't hold them for a long period of time. Not beholden to the rules, like I say, that license agencies for doing this. For some reason, and somebody has to explain this to me, they can't, they're not licensed to operate in Florida. That's who we're putting the kids with, an unlicensed agency. We couldn't find a licensed agency. One of the things that we're gonna do here is, is try and make sure that those investors don't make money and that Caliburn decides that it's really not uh, a, a good thing for it to be doing. It's not good for its business uh, to do this. We keep trying to figure out why it is they're letting us park there. And one of our theories is that this actually isn't federal land that we're on right now. One of these days, we'll take a walk back there. It doesn't really show much of the camp, but it shows the area around it. And it's kind of this desolate, ghostly, a uh, place that kind of uh, borders the airfield over there and these barracks here. I don't know if these barracks are in use. I do know the parking lot's in use. And bolstering my theory that on this side may not be federal land, is there, are, there are parking lots over here that are unused. They have a parking problem here. They're sending cars up and down on, on the, on the, uh, all over the place. They have this parking lot here that's wide open, empty, and the fact that they're not using it suggests to me that maybe it's not their land, which is why they seem to have given up um, complaining at us for walking up and down here, and maybe why they let us park in that crazy spot over there, because it's not theirs. But, you know, we're just guessing at this point. I really can't understand why they wouldn't use this parking lot. I'd love to use it. 
get to set up a little village here of protesters, right? Well, the police said something different. Police said something different. And the police say what goes here, not you. No, they don't. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, they do. And here's our here's our security person watching what we're doing. I don't think a honk actually constitutes a lawful order. What do you think? <laughs> Sir, do not point your camera over there. Hello! Hola! Hola! Sir, I asked you not to do that, okay? Yeah, I'm talking to him first. I hear you. Yeah. Hello. We got the guys over here. They're running around here and they're yelling across the fence at the kids. Take the pictures. They don't want us. Do you hear what that one kid yelled? Thank you. Thank you. I heard that. Yeah. That was a good one. Yep. Well, today, people from Congress are going to come here. And they're going to tour the place. And I hope they're not fooled by the dog and pony show that they've prepared for them. Yesterday, they replaced these flags over here with new flags. That's what they're spending their money on. New flags. So the place looks a little spruced up. <laughs> well, we have we have plenty of coverage today. Well, that's wonderful. Boy, yeah. you're, you've got a nice tan. <laughs> well, I don't know if you got it in tor in Tornillo or here. I think I got it started in Tornillo. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I tell you that he just knocked me out. I was. Yeah. <laughs> I got up this morning. I thought I don't want to go back out there. <laughs> it's cooler today. We got we got three 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 more degrees. Three three less degrees. <laughs> fewer degrees. Difference. It's gonna be bad. Yeah. <laughs> How long are you planning on staying? Well, I'd like to stay until this place closed down. Figure next week I'll go home. <laughs> you think we can close it down in a week? What brings you here, this? It's Tornillo, it's, it's Florida's Tornillo. Look at the tents. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't take these tents down in Tornillo and then transport them here and, and erect them. The problem with both of these places and what they really have in common are these extended stays mm -hmm. that uh, medical people have told us do permanent damage to these children. By the way, there's a bill that's been introduced in the Senate and in the House to shut this place down, yes. specifically to shut this place down. Yes. That memo talks about the strategy of building up a backlog of people in shelters just like this in order to send a message and deter further migration. And that's what's going on here, so it doesn't matter uh, too much, you know, whether they whether they get ice cream. It doesn't matter because it's a cage. But there's not it's not overwhelming. It's more overwhelming to do this kind of work. They don't have to do it. Uh, you know, we know it provides jobs for a lot of people and things like that, but it's, uh, a prison camp for children is just wrong. And, you know, the Trump administration is a bit stronger than us. But we're more persistent. They've got the... Uh, They've got the, uh, the, you know, the attention span of fruit flies. We're, we're pretty steady. We can stay here. We can focus. And as we did in Tornillo, as people came, as the movement built, as the press showed up, like yourself, there was enough pressure to shut that place down. Well, we're pretty tough, and we're going to tough it out.
so strange. I listen to the kids over there, and you know, they just sound like <laughs> just regular kids having a good time, you know? But it's just uh, telling Josh that um, last night I was thinking about a friend of mine I knew a long time ago and she had a 15 year old boy and she said that her friends were saying he doesn't need you anymore you should go back to work and she said actually I think he needs me now more than ever and I always remembered that because my son, I think at the time, was very, very young. But I always remembered her saying that. And now I think about these kids out there. And that's it's just, it's just impossible. OK. Let's go see the kids. Let's go see the kids. See if they've left them out there or they've. Not your I think the kids probably like it when, uh, even though they lose some of their soccer time, uh -huh. because it's a little exciting. Well, they hey. know, they also, they know. They know people are out there. here, but they also know that there's some conflict. And conflict, uh... This is what they're feeling. Yeah. yeah. I went to Tornillo in, uh, I guess it was early October. I, uh... I parked right outside the gates there with an RV. I stayed there. I held a sign. I uh, talked to press. People came. More people came. More press came. More people came. And it closed down. I've only been here a few days. I don't know what's coming and going, but I'm going to learn. The thing that you have to do in a place like this, because of what the way it's set up, is they don't want you to see. They don't want to be seen. They want to hide. They want the country to forget about it. So I'm here with my eyes and these binoculars to help me, help those eyes see what's going on here, see what's going on with these children. The young boys and girls that we visited today in Homestead are the very ones on which Donald Trump has made his political career. I spoke with a young girl who's been at the center for nine months. I think for profit has, to borrow your word, the wrong incentive. I mean, the longer the child stays here, the more profit you make. Now, fundamentally, we have to change the immigration system in this country. These are not invaders. These are people who are oftentimes frightened by what they left behind in their home countries and hopeful that the United States will be what it has been for generations of people from all over the world. I'm in front of the Homestead Detention Facility. The organization that's running this place is for profit. It's unlicensed. They don't have to follow state rigs. That means they can get away with pretty much everything they want. They're gonna get about $1,000 a day every day a kid stays here. And all this should sound familiar to you because it's not all that different from Tornillo. This is Florida's Tornillo. So you remember Tornillo, right? We went there, people showed up, press showed up, more people showed up, Congress people showed up, lots of people showed up. We were there for three months and the place was closed. This is Homestead. You know what to do.